It's August 7th, 2023. This is the best of Rook. Hi there, how are you? Welcome to episode 277 of Rook. I'm Gian Gameshi. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam Dustan Aziz. Durud Bashoma. Hope you are doing well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. We, of course, are on our ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. Today's episode is part of a Best of Rook series we are bringing to you for the entire month of August where we're looking back at some of our favorite interviews of the last three and a half years since we launched and some of our most entertaining moments and giving them to you. We've curated our faves and we hope you check these conversations out, especially if you may have missed them the first time on today's program. One of those I consider the most memorable amongst the exchanges we've had on Rook. It takes strength, perseverance, and personality to survive as a provocative Persian satirist and commentator at the top of the game for almost two decades. And even when you've been called the John Stewart of Iran, John Stewart didn't really face death threats from the main regime he was satirizing. Kambiz Hosseini has been a groundbreaking broadcaster, actor, interviewer, and opinionator on TV and radio for years. And he joins me for a rare in-depth English interview to talk about being the voice to millions of Iranians broadcasting from the diaspora. A feature interview with Kambis Hosseini coming up on the Best of Rook. Plus on this episode, we're gonna give you one of our favorite funny moments from our Rook catalog. This one entitled, Look Out for the Persian Cat Army where a history lesson about the Persians versus the Egyptians turns into a funny tangent on felines. Stay tuned for that. We're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. We're on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, and CastBox. If you want to see some visuals with Rook, if you want to watch even full interviews, uh, the video versions, switch over to our YouTube and if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in both English and in Persian and Farsi, check us out on Telegram. Remember, you can support what we do by going to our website, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com. And if you have the means, the ability, the interest, you can become a Rook member by signing on to our, you just hit the support us button and sign on to our Patreon page. It's pretty simple and it helps us stay alive and do what we do. Uh, the support us button on the main page rookmedia.com let's get started so my future guest today on the best of rook is an iranian american political satirist an actor a tv host a radio host and a monologist and a human rights advocate and for many of you he will need little introduction but take a listen to this سلام من کامی حسینی هستم و این پولیتیک است ملت there you go the unmistakable sounds of one of the best and most prolific radio podcast and tv hosts in the iranian diaspora in the last decade and a half Kambiz Hosseini. Yeah, he's smart. He's funny. He's incisive. He's both the voice of reason and balance or the beacon of controversy, depending on whom you ask. Kambiz was born in Rasht. He moved to the U.S. in the year 2000 at the age of 25, studied dramatic literature and acting both in Iran and in the United States. In 2009, Kambiz co-created the critically acclaimed political satire show Parazit, which means static in Persian in reference to the Iranian government jamming the lines of satellite television. The show ran from 2009 
2009 to 2012 and had over 1 million fans on Facebook and led the Washington Post to calling Combees the John Stewart of Iran for his satire and influence. Combees himself appeared with John Stewart on The Daily Show in 2011. Combees was given the bronze medal at the 2012 New York Festival's Best Television and Film Awards for Parasite in the comedy satire category. He was also honored with the Voice of America Gold Medal Award, the agency's highest honor for Parasite. In 2013, Combees launched a new weekly satirical podcast called Five in the Afternoon, for which he received the Reporters Without Borders Award. He also became the host of the New York-based satirical news show Politique, which aired on Radio Fardo. He currently continues to have one of the most popular podcast programs in the Iranian diaspora, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox News, PBS, NPR, PRI, CBC, and many other media outlets around the world. Kambis Hosseini has been on Rook a number of times. This was our first and most extensive occasion. He joined me from New York City. Here's that conversation. Hello, sir. It's March 2023, 2001. <laughs> this is Rook. <laughs> What's t- up, man? It's a terrible impression of me. It's a terrible. I know, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at impressions. What an honor. Gar nakubi shishe kamra besang haft rangesh mishavad haft odrang. Ya gar bekubi. It's, oh. uh, it's like you, you actually uh, throw the bottle at the stone so it just splashes and it breaks down <laughs> and it becomes and it becomes that thing. How you doing, man? How I'm, you doing? Listen, How are you holding up? I'm okay. I'm good. This has been a long yeah. time coming. I've wanted to talk to you for a long time, all the way back to you know 11 years ago, hearing that there was this Persian guy in New York being called the Iranian John Stewart. Uh, yeah. I've, we've met, obviously, in person, but we've never had a chance to interview. Sure. It's so nice to have you. Yeah. You're so, so nice you're to so, talk to you, man. You're so good at what you do you are so, You're good, so at good at what you do this is <laughs> hey let me let me tell you before you start like drilling me in uh, your like uh interview skill let me okay. tell you something i uh i i got into media without knowing because i was an actor i was like a theater guy i wasn't never a media person so uh when i got this interview thing included in my uh, proposed show at the time i was looking for a reference and how do i interview people and how and then i came across you um i think you had at the time you had this show called q or something q it was yeah. q right or yeah. or a, th- there was a play or q there was play was uh, the tv show yeah. then q yeah no q so and then the opening essays and the <laughs> writings and and the, the taste in music and rhythm and the tempo and the interview skill you had man and and the, you were like the way you were dancing across the red lines uh, with the cbc with all these guidelines and everything and on, on top of that, the uh, Billy Bob uh, handling, <laughs> the Billy Bob handling interview. I think, you know what? I think everybody, uh, whoever wants to interview anybody in media, they should, I think they should teach that Billy Bob interview in universities. I think they actually the, did no, for a while. They, they taught yeah, that. Yeah. The, the, yeah. I mean, the way you handled the guy and uh, you were giving contacts. Uh, uh. Uh, and then, then, then the, 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 I think the, um, the question, do you want to continue if you want to talk? about music i mean the way you uh, handled that i think it was um, i learned a lot from that Thank so you. i want to appreciate you uh, because um, no matter what people say i uh, i i do learn a lot from you i did uh-huh. in my life and and i think no no matter what pi- people say you- <laughs> <laughs> no matter what people say and uh-huh. I, and i and I, you know it, it was it was interesting for me to uh-huh. uh, to see a guy uh, who's pushing people's bottom without insulting them you were offending people yes but not insulting them yes you know yeah but i feel the same thing about you i i mean first of all thank you for let's let's do the ta- let's do the taro off first That's so we can the, get the, away. Well, it's not ta- <laughs> is it taught off if it was taught off I'll, I'll, I mean, no 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 this I, is the, the, no this is like i really mean what i said man well i you, really mean it listen i i agree no matter no matter what people say about you <laughs> Coming right at me, huh? You couldn't wait for two minutes. <laughs> Regardless of what everyone says about you, 
I still feel. No, listen, I mean, first of all, it, it, it occurs to me that for most Iranians listening, I mean, that whole intro I just did is redundant because, of course, they know who Kambi Soseni is. And yet for non-Iranians listening or those who grew up entirely in the West and only consume English media, I mean, yeah. they would have no idea who you are. Is that an interesting paradox, if you'll forgive me for using that word, for you, given sure. that you've been in the West for 20 years, yeah. but your audience isn't necessarily Western? It's weird because, look, um, uh, people like me or you or people in media, they need feedback, like constant, like live feedback from from what they do. Because as soon as um, we release an episode, the episode dies right there. I mean, whatever you give your best right. and, and, and do whatever you want to do and it dies. And then all you need is live feedback. And I don't get that. Here in New York, I'm right, just like right. sit, probably I could even sit in Mars and do this. You know, <laughs> it's, it, this is this is how lonely uh, <laughs> my show is. That I'm uh, I'm sitting somewhere and now I have I'm hanging out with different people and I have uh, probably uh, my everyday life is way different than everyday life in Iran. But uh, somehow my audience are in Iran, which is like uh, thousands of thousands of kilometers or miles away. So, But hundreds uh, of it's, thousands, it's, it's, I mean, millions in terms of the audience. It's interesting. Is it a way of, I mean, the... You know, the obvious thing to say would be, is it a way of keeping you real? Like you do this, you do your show, a million people listen to it, and then you walk outside in Brooklyn and nobody knows who you are. Is that, yeah. is that, is that somehow healthy for you? No, it's unhealthy for me. It's, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's very unhealthy. You, you want me. to be carried on the shoulders of the of the crowd outside your door. That's that's what the media is all about. You know, it's it's that you you project you 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 uh, you become naked uh, in front of your audience. And uh, you let them judge uh, the size of your penis. So you want to know that uh, what people think. And uh, it's not like high art when you, you go do something and then uh, you hide away and then you look for, for reviews or, or you just uh, put your voice out for the elites uh, out there. Um, I'm trying to talk to the majority of people in Iran people who uh, are not as informed as I uh, want them to be. Um, so, and I don't have no connection with them. It's, it's really hard to, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm relying on ro social media a lot to find out, but you know how social media is. It's yes. not, you can't rely on it. So, so it's, it's really, it's really difficult. You, let me, uh, you've said quite a bit there. Let me pick up on uh, those things. <laughs> a do few it. The, Drill a few me. of the things you do said. It. So, do so, it, Jian Khomeishi, <laughs> do it. <laughs> First. Have you ever written a Jian, by the way? That was my question. Do the, you know what Jian? No, it, is, have you ever... it, is, it is not lost on me that I'm named after a shit per, uh, French car. <laughs> it's not yeah. shit. It's actually cool. It's very actually cool right now. If you, is it? If you have is a, it making a comeback, no, the Jian car? I just know it was, hey man, I mean, it was considered you, a lemon. You, no. <laughs> but if you have a Jian in Canada right now, well, uh, I think you can sell it for uh, more than $50,000 or something. I've never even seen one in person. I've only seen pictures you have, of them. No, I really, so my, yeah. my, my dad owned one. And he taught me how to drive with that shit. Uh. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> so wait a second. I, I, I'm responsible for your career and your driving so far. All right. I mean, yeah, this is, I, I'm enjoying this. Why no, are no, you responsible? No, you're responsible for the interview skill that uh, I learned. Okay. You know, it's Well, it's I'll like, take that. I'll take that. I yeah, yeah. You are a great we, interviewer. I enjoy watching you. So let me ask you this, though. Why are, for, for, I want to deconstruct what you just said, and we'll get to the penis and all the things you said there. Why, <laughs> why are you... First of all, why are you in this media game? What what do you what do you love about interviewing people and making this programming? I, the reason I ask is, having been in it and having been uh, through the ups and downs of it, it can feel like I mean you are putting yourself out there one way or another, um, and you have been indefatigable. I mean you keep going. The show ends and you start a new show, and you keep going and you keep going. You're the Energizer Bunny, but it, it it can, especially in media, especially when you're scrutinized, especially when you got to keep putting out new mm -hmm. content, it can feel like knocking your head against the wall. So, what is it that you love so much about doing this that makes you keep doing it? 
look, I'm not a media, I'm, I, even though I saw really early media, but I was never uh, like a media guy. I always thought that TV and radio are cheap, and I have to go after a theater and cinema and, and, and the art that I, that I can express myself fully. Uh, but at one point in my life, I got tired of um, counting my beers that I drink in a bar. <laughs> And and I you know I didn't have any money I was I was like a theater guy in in Portland Oregon and uh, it was like uh, right after um, Bush war against Iraq uh-huh. uh, and so there were like so many uh, playwrights that were writing uh, Middle Eastern uh, parts you know oh I, so I, I, was, I, I, was, I missed this part where you were in Oregon that's yeah, interesting yeah, was, uh, yeah no I studied theater in Oregon four okay. years you know it's like and then I was I became this um, hipster poor artist uh, who um, has to count his cigarettes, uh, his, his drinks at bar. So I got just fucking tired of this, man. So I started like looking for how I can make more money um, doing what I do, and then I sold my soul to Persian media. Oh wow! What a what a yeah. what a rook way of putting this. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no, no, no. But that, the other thing was, look, um, when you when you do theater, you only have like six hundred people coming in your premiere every time. Yes. Three hundred people out of that six hundred people look at you. They're all like above like seventy year olds, by mm-hmm. the way. So they're not like young people. And uh, like elite audience, 300 of them, they say, oh, you're great. The other three, 300, they say, oh, you suck. And the, the another premier, the, the, uh, the, these people switch, you know? And I just got sick and tired of catering my message or my art my, to only 600 old people. So I'm like, how can I uh, reach more mm-hmm. to more, uh, more people that they actually need to get informed? And to, uh, to answer your question, I do what I do for myself when I was 15, 14, 15 years old, mm-hmm. a teenager looking in Iran and, and, and sitting in my small room full of books. And I was like a theater guy, right? I was like a, uh, you know, kind of, kind of a poet at the time. So I, I just like lo- look around to get informed, more information. So I'm just catering for myself. Mm. Uh, the guy, the fifteen-year-old guy, who's but I, let me, thirsty let, for information. Let me uh, nejat you a little bit here because nejat uh, me, nejat <laughs> me, <laughs> nejat me, Jean. because because I, I because one wouldn't want to think that you only do this for you because I think that you are. Um, someone passionate about society, passionate about trying sure. to make a difference. But so I was part of that society. You know, I was part of the fucked up society that I was living in. You know, so I'm I'm the example of a generation that uh, they just didn't have. Uh, everything is blocked mm. in Iran. Everything is blocked. You know, Twitter is blocked. Facebook is blocked. Uh, everything is blocked. So at the time, we didn't have this. That the, the internet wasn't as huge as today. But still, everything was blocked. And when when they um, take away um, uh, information from you, you actually get more thirsty to learn more, right. to see more. You know. You know it's. Uh, I mean, the thing about you is you, and you just said you uh, you put yourself out there naked, and you, uh, you know, um, I understand what you're saying. At the same time, especially when you're doing interviews, it isn't supposed to be about you, right? It's supposed to be about sure. the guest. So, so, yeah, but, the, yeah. the, but the interesting, this is kind of the again the paradox of Kambi Soseni in the sense that you don't hide behind a postulate of, of objectivity all the time. You're not like a, a BBC no, news, no. A newsman, you know? No, you, no, no. You I have opinions, sides. you do monologues, sure. you say what's on your yeah, mind. Yeah. That said, yeah. or in you have, that- You have in, opinions too, man. You have well, opinions too. I, I do, mean. I do, but I, see, I'm pretty committed when I have somebody on the show to yeah. trying to make it about them. In between, when I'm talking to the team or doing my own thing, or if I'm doing a, a monologue off the top, yes. But sure. but so it, you, it's walking that line, and that's what I'm gonna to want to ask you. I mean, how, how much of what you do or want to do is about being able to express yourself, and how much of it is about extracting opinions and information from others? There are two parallel line in what you're asking, but this parallel line meets somewhere in, in, in the future. Okay. You know what I mean? In an indefinite like future, um, uh, they meet somewhere. So I, I've tried to find uh, a common, uh, let's say, values or or common uh, uh, like shared values between these two. So I project that more. But if you're if you're if you're talking about my shows and what I do, to be honest, I I try so hard to be myself. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but I work in in a certain media outlet that I have to um, obey the guidelines, and I always like. Um, dance on the red lines that uh, <laughs> yes. you know everybody everybody does that and yes. and and uh, you know no at the no, same time, no 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 <laughs> Every, everybody doesn't do that this yeah. is what sets you apart everybody doesn't do that in fact everybody that I admire they do that uh-huh. Let's put it this okay way. Yeah, right yeah. right because I, I I mean one of the things that I would uh, um, one doesn't want to make generalizations or be too dismissive, but one of the things that I lament about the new spate of what I see in terms of Iranian yeah. media is that there is that there's too many people trying to ape some kind of um, old school, you know, British or or American, uh, you know, veneer of, uh, of 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 vanilla of of, of you yeah. know. Uh, it, sure. In other words, it, it either has to be this crazy Fox News or you know um, outlandish you know uh, monologue kind of stuff, or that that it has to be this very boring button down. I'm wearing yeah. a suit and I'm speaking but in yeah, hush tones. Hey, I, and I, and uh, there's got to be yeah. some middle ground, I think. Yeah, there is no middle ground. It's just you have to pay price to do something new and uh, for that you get fired you <laughs> you lose your shit you know uh, it's it's not easy to just go to a mainstream media and uh, and and bring your honest uh, creativity and opinion and try to enforce that and try to make a, 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 a like a media product out of that and, and and put it out it's not easy to do that and you pay a price for that and like mm-hmm. i did and mm-hmm. like uh, you know um, but one thing people don't one thing i want to i want to tell you one one thing i learned from you is mm-hmm. that you were always um uh, orchestrated Yes. Uh, you you were not you were uh, you were always like wrote down your shit, and then you delivered it. You know, it's this this pre production thing that you've done. In your well, shows. I, I wouldn't say uh, orchestrated as much as I do. I still do. It's it's important to me to do fastidious research to do as much as I possibly can and yeah. then I try and throw it away during the interview but but that's only me I'm not saying that to to win a, a medal I mean I there are interviewers that I think are good who follow the I, the notion of uh, of you know turn on the mic and let's see where the conversation goes sure. and, and I'm not gonna I don't have a, a plan I don't have an arc I don't have a but I yeah. I, I have a very clear idea going into a conversation or I like that's to, great of but where look, it's no, gonna no, go you have one thing you have you have one important thing thing and that you have um basically uh, uh, when you start talking i want to know what's next <laughs> you know it's like uh, there's there's like a uh, there's like a hitchcock movie going on there <laughs> But you're like, wow. it's, this is Jean Romeshi, and I'm, it's, you know, this is Roque, or you were saying, oh, it's like whatever. Your voice, actually, in the beginning of your show, give me, gives me a lot of stress, man. Stress? Like, oh, yeah, a lot oh, of stress. I'm like, okay. what the fuck? There is something going on, and I have to pay attention? <laughs> oh, my God, what's happening? It's just like my heart is start beating. What the fuck am I going to do? I don't know what to do. You, you know make what me I mean? sound it's like just... Sir Alec Guinness or something. <laughs> <laughs> I am coming to you. No, 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 no. It's just no. It's it's sort of you. You have that, and I think what uh, what's important about your uh, your rhythm is that you um, you you came from the music background. Yeah. So you know, so you know the difference uh, between tempo and rhythm. I love and, you. And, do you know yeah. what? <laughs> Did, do you know what? Let me tell you something. I have only ever said this. I think maybe twice in my in maybe 20 years i've only i'm gonna out it to you you know i'm a, a, my background is a drummer I, I, and i and i yeah. uh when i start an interview i listen to the the person talking and i count out the rhythm of the way they're talking and i try and match the rhythm to bring them in to make the to, to bring comfort to the conversation so we're dancing together i literally it's obvious do it's obvious well for that, me that really? i'm a music really lover. you yeah. could actually for that, me uh, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm a failed musician, so it's obvious for me. You know, yeah. I can, I can, I can, I can count the rhythm, but it's obvious for me that the um, uh, this guy um, gets the rhythm, and he tries to whenever the uh, the rhythm drops, you bring in something to pick it up, 
I don't know how interesting this um, conversation is, is to anyone. For yes, but I'm you know. enjoying it. Yeah, uh, yeah, but, yeah. But, but let me, <laughs> but let me ask you this: Do you, do you, when I watch you and I listen to you, I mean, you are one of the masters of. Uh, you're very spontaneous. Um, you're quick with a rebuttal. You're qu- you're funny. Uh, how much research do you do? I mean, how a lot. How, Okay, lot, so you so that's yeah. that's I mean you are half winging it, but you're yeah. also orchestrated. You know what I do? I I write the whole show, and then I rehearse it, and then when I rehearse it, I add some spontaneous sp- uh, stuff, yes. and maybe some uh, you know uh, some topok and uh, and those things. But I write those things back to the script, yes, and then I start acting. The, the spontaneous ones you know what i mean you know i'm so, so i'm so, so glad I'm, so, so all i'm well I'm, I'm so i'm very well scripted that's what i'm saying i'm so glad you said that because i secretly do believe that the only way to be really good is to is to script is to is to you know um yeah get get yourself prepared as much as possible and so yeah. to know that you do do that it makes sense sure. to me because you're so good at what you do part of your brilliance combis is has been we and, and by the way i mean for people listening this this won't just be a um uh I, I I won't just turn this into a, a complimenting each other fest because I, I I do want to hear. Yeah, some of your why story, not? But, Let's do it. Let's but, do but, it. What's what's the problem with complimenting each other? What's the problem? What is the? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what, you know what they call this in the old school media? And my apologies to everyone for the vernacular here. We'll probably edit this up. But you know what they call this? Um, what we used to call this a blowjob interview when you when you're. <laughs> <laughs> And you're just, I love you're that. just, uh, you Don't know, take you're, pleasure, Don't you're pleasuring take each out. other. You're pleasuring each other. Uh, par, part of but your- look, no, no, look, dude. Here's the thing. I wanted to tell you this thing for, for, for because, because I, 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 I think I met you a couple of times, yeah. but we didn't get to talk about like deep into these yeah. things because yeah. we were in a, in a, an occasion or Crowd. situation yeah, that yeah, yeah. it was crowded and we couldn't talk so much. So this is actually the first time I'm getting to talk to you like person to person. That's why I'm saying this. There is no blowjob, which, which, <laughs> well, by the way, I have no problem with blowjobs. So that's just, so you know. <laughs> Fantastic. We've got it on, we've got it on the record. Uh, yeah, this you got is, it on record. Uh, you know, what, what I was going to say is part of your, um, and, and by the way, we've had the chance, like we've traded messages for about, uh, I don't know, nine months, a year or something and, uh, about doing this. And I, I kind of part of me wanted the first real big conversation to be with, with record pressed on, you know, because I just thought it would be, it'd be more fun than that. So, so I'm enjoying this part, you know, part of your brilliance is, is weaving in comedy and you've suggested that wasn't always the intent. Like you did this public talk a couple of years ago where you said, I wasn't a comedian. They forced me to be one. What do you mean by that? Basically, sometimes in parties and like your family parties and stuff, I would say something that I thought it was true, but half of people will laugh and the other half of people will get angry. Um, So I've never, and then just because of the laugh I got, I thought, oh, okay, this is funny. But I always made people angry uh, with whatever I I thought that is funny that I'm going to say, you know. Um, I never thought, I'm I'm a very tragic person, actually. I'm a very sensitive guy, Um, sensitive towards what's going on. I think happy people are stupid. (laughs) And no, seriously, with all the shit is going on around you in the world, how could you be fucking happy? There is no story in happy people's uh, life, you know? (sighs) You know, it's just... Uh, the the story about how people like like people uh, 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 I don't know uh, A and B are happy. End of the story. You know there is no story in there. But if you are sensitive towards um, your society, uh, towards your society with sensitivities, you know you you have to be a little bit like you have to have a melancholy a little bit in your in your work. You can't mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. be like shiny happy because there's lots of shit going on in the world right now. Uh, and and then we can't do that. And uh, but at, at some point in my life, I I said those things that I thought I thought it was they were tragic. People should cry. And then some people were like, uh, started laughing at it because the the, the greatest uh, comedy came from tragedy. Right. You know when the, when you surpass this uh, this uh, this thing that when one like particular subject is so much tragic. And it's so much, it becomes absurd. And absurdity is funny. 
you know? That's how I became a funny guy. I don't know mm. how, but I never wanted to. Uh, I'm very angry and I'm very serious about what I say, but if you laugh, good. But first of all, it's a great, obviously, it's a great device, right? You can you can ask probing questions or push your guests in a way that a straight interviewer cannot. I, I always remember, I always think of this. I remember Jon Stewart in, uh, interviewing Parviz Musharraf, the um, president of Pakistan or prime minister of Pakistan, whatever he was at the time, and asking him questions that no... Sort of, you know, uh, network anchor would ever be able to ask Parviz Musharraf. You know, uh, uh, like I, I don't know. But I can't he remember. wasn't a network anchor, though. That's the thing. No, it was because he could do it as a comedian. No, you, you, you so did he the could... same thing too, and you weren't a comedian. That's you asked, correct. Uh, that and is you correct. You weren't even a journalist. But I'm. A, but I. But well, that's also part of. I agree with you. That I'm saying it's a device. You, if you're a bit of a personality, you can say, "Well, I'm not really an official." You know, I'm just sort of in fact when my show on cbc got so big that it was so important and everything it made it more difficult for me to do interviews because the expectation was that it was an important interview sure. and so and then i have to i have to stay you within the lines everybody. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah yeah exactly you know yeah. and you interview everybody but the thing is man here's the thing uh the way that um um I'm, I'm, I'm continuing with the below job situation. Oh boy. The way uh, that you um, uh, conducted those interviews and not getting emotional, when people pushed your buttons. You know, lots of people in your interviews, that watch many of your interviews, they pushed your buttons, mm -hmm. but you came back and instead of getting, em because, it, because human instinct is, uh, you know, I've done it in my interviews and people push my button and I came back and say, who the fuck are you talking <laughs> to me like that? You know yeah. what I mean? But yes. you never it, done that. That's you know? not you helpful. Just, you just, you, know, yeah, helpful, you, you yeah. know why? It's because it, it's the edict is the audience is smart. Trust the audience. The audience will ultimately know what's going on in a good interview. Uh, but you know, people, people can put you on uh, top of the world and they can destroy you. Oh, that's true, too. So that's true, too. I just yeah. mean in terms of the actual broadcast. They, yeah, yeah. You know, people can, you, you don't have to spell it out for them. If somebody's being, uh, you know, uh, um, unhelpful during an interview, the audience can yeah. hear that. Uh, if Siavash Meshi is not playing along with you, my my dad's cousin uh, <laughs> uh, in an is interview. your dad cousin? He is. Yeah. Oh, you're you. Oh, you related to to Gomeshi? Yes. Can we finish this interview now? <laughs> <laughs> You you didn't enjoy your interview with him, huh? <laughs> I uh, I mean I didn't, but at the same time, um, I don't know, man. I don't want to talk about it. It just it brings more controversy to something. I, it's very it doesn't old. matter. But, it doesn't but, matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, what what the, the question but that comes he's up? He's a brilliant songwriter, though. He's a well, brilliant of course. songwriter. The question yeah, that comes yeah, up yeah. for me, and and notoriously not an easy interview. You weren't alone, and I've never interviewed him. And part of the reason has been because he's been like, no, I don't. Let's not do it. You know, like, uh, but. It raises an interesting question, which is um, because I on the scene of Aliolo show, you said, uh, Sina said, well, did you tell him he's being difficult? And you said, no, I don't really like him. I don't know if you were being funny, <laughs> but if you weren't being, it doesn't matter. But but I'm curious about that, because where you where you see the line between giving someone a platform and not if you're not a fan, if you don't really like I, I always find it difficult, especially when it comes to well known people that are going to yeah. be good for your show, that there's an audience that wants to, you know, sure. they want to hear from them. And you're kind of thinking, you know, any any time I put somebody on the show, I'm taking the, uh, the place away from somebody else that I could put on. And sure. so do I put them on even if I don't like them because it's good for the show or do I just not even bother? Where, where are you on that? No, it's uh, I mean, you, you actually did a great on, on interviewing people you didn't like. Um, I uh, when I started interviewing people, I wasn't as mature as today. I don't think I'm, <laughs> I'm very mature right now, but I'm I'm, I'm thinking I was very young and um, I was uh, I was learning as uh, time was going episode by episode. I was learning from myself and from uh, the reaction I was getting from my guests. So that was one of those like educational process for me. That um, you yes, you interview people you don't like and. Uh, uh, well, but, some, uh, but, actually, but you don't have to. But, you don't but, have to. I, I actually like most people. I, I, I almost, I like almost everybody. I, I find things to like about them, and uh, because you how's, kind how's, of how's 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 Iranian people treating you, Jan? 
<laughs> you like everybody. I love huh? them. I love them. No, we'll get into that. We'll get. Into, I'm talking about. I I can find things that I. Lo- you know, the only I'll tell you my story of who was who, my version of the Sea of Achshar You have many was, stories. My I have friend. many stories, many but it's, stories. it's not it's not Billy Bob. But yeah, I actually okay. you know and and uh, because that that the, you know that interview that you referenced uh, was actually became so controversial that it it we be, it, the show became number one. I mean, it, it was actually very helpful. No, it was, it's, it's actually but educational. Very Very early in my career, very early, like this is like 2003, I had just started and um, I had a TV, it was a junket, you know what, you you know, for people who don't know what junkets are out there, junkets are when there's a, you go, you know, there's a a movie coming out and a bunch of the actors or the cast of the movie are set up in a hotel and and there's a, 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 an assembly line of interviewers that go in, you know, uh, TV or, you know, media people and everybody gets five minutes with these actors who are generally exhausted and un- uninterested and answering the same questions over and over again and it was my first year doing that and i had harrison mm. ford and i went in oh oh i remember that 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 guy was a dick to you man y- he was you, a fucking dick you to do you. Remember, I remember this that. because yeah. it was it was a disaster and the, yeah. the the thing the only difference between then and now would be that I now have the confidence to know when someone's not playing along to to either know that it's not about me or to call them on I go look do you not want to be doing this interview you know yeah. I went in and I and I had prepared this opening question you know and he barely looked up at me at the time I had this little like my new wave haircut and I was you know I thought it was really important you know, trying to look good <laughs> look good for Harrison Ford and you know I said uh, something like it, it, he had put out this um, film called uh, K-19 The Widowmaker it's about a submarine where he plays a Russian captain and I said something like uh, I'd, I'd rehearsed this first question where I said you know you are known for playing these iconic Americans like um, uh, Indiana Jones and, and yeah. Han Solo and, and you know the Jack Clancy films and you know and, and, and Jack Ryan or whatever and now you're playing a Russian captain that must be so interesting for you uh, tell me uh, what that's like and he barely looked up his hand was like cu- you know cupping his, his cheek and he just kind of barely looked at me and he said, and rolled his eyes and said, well, it's acting, isn't it? You know, and I died. Like I thought, oh my yeah, God, yeah. the interview is tanking. Harrison Ford hates me. I'm a terrible interviewer, you know. Sure. And, and, and then I, so I left and it was just a disaster. And, you know, and then like, a week later, I saw him on Conan O'Brien or something, and he was just as bad, right? Like he, he's just not. <laughs> and, and and I said to somebody, some somebody, but he was me, Indiana Jones, and he was Harrison Ford. And, <laughs> that's you know? right. Yeah. Well, but that's part me, of the yeah. intimidation. I thought, well, this guy, yeah. what does he care about me? He's done. You know, he's been interviewed a billion times. You know, so um, that was forever. I learned my lesson with Harrison Ford. I was just like, you know what? No well, one's going to treat you, me like that again. Sure. But let me tell you a, a little. Um, a memory I have with Harrison Ford when I was living in LA like early 2000 uh, you know I started working this uh, Starbucks in um, um, uh, I think it was in Bel Air and uh, Harrison Ford was my first customer every day 5 a.m. really and he would yeah and he would come and buy like one um, tall um, just drip drip uh, coffee and give me 20 bucks <laughs> yeah, you know uh, oh really you had so, a good experience then, with her yeah <laughs> then he would he would come with his pajamas uh, you know it was like come on as like a normal guy and always a smile always a smile at me and he's like I like terrorists and stuff like that so <laughs> <laughs> you know he would he would give me that look you know I'm, I'm okay with me you distance, see you know? if we had only known each other back then <laughs> I, I would have orchestrated you spilling the coffee on him or something. You know? <laughs> I never wanted to because the guy was always like quiet and he was like, "Hey man, can I get the can I get the usual?" I'm like, "Yeah." yeah. You know what? You know? To, to 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 in 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 defense of Harrison Ford. He was in a long journey. I mean, this is something from seven, you know, 18 years ago that, that <laughs> happened. I, I'm judging this guy for the last 18 years based on 30 seconds with him, which is yeah. entirely unfair. But it, but it was definitely my, uh, you know, it's up there with the worst interview experiences. There's something you said that I can't let go before right, I, 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 I want to I want to get into you as a child in your do childhood. Do it, Jian. She is Do you this, know what she is I is? do, I do. Yeah. You're referencing so you, the you, car you, and the <laughs> courage and everything. Yeah. Uh, you're, you've definitely done your homework. <laughs> if um, you, you said you're a tragic person. Yes. Um, okay, first of all, 
Did you mean that you see the world in tragic ways or you see your own life as tragic? Both. Wow. I mean, how do you see your life as tragic? It's that I've been in love 18 times. I never made it happen. Um, uh, feeling loved is something I, uh, you know, you have a lot of fans and people, but you never, uh, you know, sometimes you need to get approval from the person. I mean, pe uh, you know this, this, this thing that everybody gives you approval, but if it's one person that mm -hmm. you need to get approval from yeah. and he or she doesn't give you the approval. And uh, that means you did nothing in your life, you know. So um, that part of my life is, yeah, it's always been tragic. I've never got approval for, from, for what I do from people I love. Really? Too heavy for you? <laughs> no, 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 fast. I mean, thank you for being so, yeah, yeah. so honest. But I mean... Yeah. Uh, first of all, re did you count eighteen times, or were you saying that sort of metaphorically? Yeah, yeah, I was. I was in a relationship eighteen times in my life, and whenever I I, I, fought, I fell in love, I'm like, hey, let's uh, uh, let's have a baby, uh, and and they said, with you, no way. What do you think goes wrong every time? I, maybe I need a lot of me time. Maybe I'm too much too much of a narcissistic motherfucker. I don't know, man. Maybe I don't. Uh, Maybe I want love, but I don't like maintain love. You know, the maintenance is 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 a very important part of the whole situation. Maybe I don't do that. Maybe maybe I'm just an immature motherfucker. I don't know, man. Well, maybe, can I can I make a suggestion? It's, sure. It's hard to be with someone who says they don't think people should be happy. The true. No, I I I, I think to, I think people should be happy. But if you're just happy for no reason. That means you're not sensitive towards your society's sensitivities. Uh, that means you don't know shit. That means you're a dumb, dumbass. That's that's what I think. But you know, people who are—I um, mean, you weren't in the West. In the we're Gen Xers, and in the '90s, uh, if you were a Gen Xer like me, we you know. It, how the, how the, old are you? What what year you're born? I'm I'm, I'm like 1982. <laughs> Very nicely done, sir. <laughs> I, I, I was born in 1975, so we're, you, we're you're, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm older than you. I thought you were. I thought we were around the same age. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm seven years older than you. But wow! I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. But 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 in my in the 1990s. We there was something you know there was it was a very dark period for of youth culture. It's like if you see the movies like um, Singles and Reality Bites and things like that. It was it was um, you know especially in the music scene there was this grunge death metal kind of scene and stuff, and there was there was a lot of um, attraction to the romance of self abuse. You know, the Soundgarden, Nine Inch Nails, all these kind of bands that I was uh, on the periphery of that I would uh, who saw some value in um, in being down in the dumps and being and, you know, kind of, um, you know, either drinking yourself into oblivion or or doing drugs or, but just you know, you know, seeing what's funny? things through a dark portal. Yeah. You know, what's and that's funny? a really dangerous place to go. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's funny that I was born in Iran and I grew up in the 90s in Iran, but I have the same same idols as you do like nirvana was uh, was the king you know and all these guys they were self-deconstructive people they did drugs to the death and they um basically um uh, this like new hipster hopeful um, uh, um, uh, latte every morning kind of <laughs> lifestyle that we're, we're proposing to the to the society right now never existed back then so uh, all my idols committed suicide man yes so yes I, I, I forever have know? wanted to write a book because no one else has about how uh, all of these people from the 1990s again a lot of Iranians might not know these names but starting with uh, Kurt Cobain but then but then Chris Cornell of Soundgarden the guy from Allison Chains you know Scott Whelan from from uh, Stone Temple Pilots like all of them all of them are dead you know and you add in Prince and you add in a few other artists you know uh, it's crazy right Bowie Can I tell you something which is funny it, it not not only happened to me but uh, to many people around uh, around me that when we passed 27 and we didn't die everybody told us oh so you're not as great 
You're not genius. So you don't belong in 27 right. clubs. Right. So my 28th birthday was a funeral. Because everybody thought I'm not genius. Right. right. <laughs> you know? The 27 Club being Hendrix and Kurt Cobain. Yeah, and, all, yeah, yeah. All, all the people who yeah. self-deconstructed, you know? But people. but but I, where I was going with that was actually to say that I I the the romance of self abuse is not something that I subscribe to. I don't think people should should um, I, I I know what you're saying about how horrible the world is, but I don't think the panacea for that, the tonic for that, is for us to be moping around and and. You know, I agree. Su- su- I totally you know, agree with you. It's well, listen. You know, I've been through shit in my life. I know you've been through yeah. shit in your life. You you have two options: succumb or surmount. And sure. if you're going to surmount, you cannot be down in the dumps twenty four seven. It's not going to yeah. serve you. It's not going to serve you with others too. Uh, you know, in relationships. No, I, I or agree. Man, I I totally agree with you and all you say. But uh, uh, regarding uh, growing, uh, uh, going through shit in your life. It's, it's only that it, it, there is no other way, man. Every, everybody who is w- putting their voice out and they're getting shit. There is no way that you cannot put your voice out and not get shit. But at the same time, you know, in the beginning of my career, I was I was very a little bit um, not um, appreciative to people that they make me look good, you know? I mean, now... Uh, I'm, I'm a different guy now everybody who works uh, with me in my show I know they're trying so hard to make me look good so I'm, I'm, I'm more appreciated towards yeah, them yeah. but but in the beginning I was like I'm bringing the shit so you have to follow yeah. you know so I was a little bit uh, um, uh, you know not very nice I hear but, you I've, yeah, I've learned but, those but, lessons as well yeah yeah, yeah. But, but now I mean as I'm uh, growing older I mean I learned that people who make you look good they deserve appreciation yeah. You know, uh, I, I want to come back to the, what, what yeah, dealing with detractors and things like that. Let me, yeah. I, I, I'm curious a little bit about your, your, um, not a little bit. I'm curious about, uh, your story as how you ended up being this guy who, uh, lives in Brooklyn and, and, and broadcasts to millions of people, uh, who, uh, who are, you have a huge fan base. It's, it's, a, it's such an interesting story of how you became this guy. You were, what was little Kambis Hosseini, a little kid in Rasht in the north of Iran in yeah. the late, se- late 70s and early 80s? How would you describe that kid? I was, at, uh, I was a radio host when I was 10 years old. I was, um, I was hosting this very popular children's show called the Islamic uh, Blossom Revolution or whatever. <laughs> yes. And I think my, it's called the Islamic job, Revolution Blossoms. Revolution Blossom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and then my job was to brainwash uh, kids that they were uh, their their dads were in, in the war, and, and my job was if your dad is not coming back, don't don't worry. I mean, if he's dead, don't worry. You should go. He's in heaven, and you should go to heaven too. Uh, so, and then I was uh, very like famous when I was a kid. So the whole celebrity status thingy. Uh, wait, just, wait a second. Uh, Somebody would who, who, what? Uh, I don't understand. You're a ten year old kid. Yeah. who has to go on and say it's okay to go to war and you're going to go go to heaven i mean basically uh, that we know that part that that tragically young people were sent to the front lines of the iran iraq yeah. war but were you given it how did you get selected to be this guy i just it's just like it was a talent show uh they came to my school and um uh, and they came to my class and they asked the uh, uh, there was, uh, was uh, I don't I remember, uh, that it was like a, a class of Encha. That was the only, the only class I was good at. If, if it was like a, a math class, I wouldn't be picked. Uh, it was Encha when you like a speech class, you know, you write uh-huh. essays and, and you read your essays in front of everybody else. And in that class, my, my teacher, when they came to class and they said, hey, uh, uh, introduce us like one person, and he uh, gave them me. And he said, he's my best guy. So I went over there and I start like, uh, they gave me a script and I read it and they picked me in the school and they picked me in the region. And it was like a whole process. Oh, what did your parents and think of this? Like, were they okay with it? They got the money. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. So you were getting paid. You're getting, yeah, of course. And you would, you, they would give you a script and you would have to yeah. read the script. And, and it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's so... It's, yeah. it, 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 you know, I'm not, this is, I, I wasn't there, right? This reminds yeah. me of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia and the kids having yeah. to, I mean, this is really scary stuff. 
Yeah. Huh. And and I got and I got basically out of that because we have so many um, artists because uh, it's, it's, it's a cat show, you know, uh, and there were so many artists like women that uh, I would meet them in green room and they basically told me that hey man you you got a little bit of talent you should you should go for theater because that's the roots of all this performance so you got to say so I got in, because of their suggestion because their advice I got into theater and I did more than probably 300 plays in my life so far so I did a lot of I, I come from a deep theater uh, background yes. and, and with that background I went to media uh, it's strange to me that you endure being in Iran in the 80s and 90s as an artist uh, as this it was young tough age. man but, but then I'm not like but then uh, as things I mean in relative terms start to open up a little bit in the year 2000 what what was the precipitant for leaving iran then that's a love story first of all that's a love story i was ah. in love with this girl and we and then uh we came to us together but but to be honest with you i didn't leave iran because um they came and they watched my stage and they prayed on it. I didn't leave Iran because the Irshad, Vezarat Irshad was rejecting all my plays. And I didn't leave Iran because Sadao Sima wasn't paying me. I left Iran because of fucking people, man. I just, I was getting in fight with people every day. And if I were living, I would be killed by now. I would go on the on the, on the taxi and I see this guy that he's basically uh, getting too close to the women. There were like three people sitting back in the taxi, right? And uh, there was like this man is trying to uh, harass this woman. And I would raise my voice. I was like, what the fuck you're doing, man? Don't do this. And then usually, uh, uh, you know, those people are macho and they fucking punch you in the fucking face, you know? So I was getting killed by uh, every day I would go out on the street and things bothered me that maybe it's uh, it's related to how um, the regime is is uh, is uh, putting the pressure on people and making them who they are uh, but people are bothering me in Iran man the the, the 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 things that was happening especially with women and um, and the way that men Iranian men treating women in Iran it was bothering me i mean mm. i uh, i had i mean i was in theater i had a lot of gay friends and uh, um, you know i was i was feeling that this this people can can't live in iran and can't be themselves and they have to always hide something and all right, those right. these things this little like humane things were, were bothering me so much so when i came out of iran and i just uh, you know i happened to uh, had uh, you know a girlfriend who brought me to us and and I felt that individualism here. I felt like, all right, so even though I'm a nobody, even though I don't have no names, even though I have uh, no nothing, but I'm still a human being here, you know? Mm. Uh, th this is this is the thing that was lacking in Iran for me, and and I and I just just flee Iran because of that. Although the timing is conspicuous, within a year nine nine sure. eleven happens. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and then I had to I had to went through <laughs> that shit. You kidding me? Nine eleven, and I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I I don't believe in religion and all those. But I had to I had to answer for all those things. And and the way I handled that, whoever came to me and 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 looked at me as a terrorist, and I'm like, all right, come hug me. I fucking explode. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is this is how I survived all the time with satire and jokes. You know, it, it, it's so interesting that you should. The, the the picture you just painted of Iran or Iranians, at least at that time, 1999, 2000, the, the time when you just, you, it's enough, you left. Um, it's not a rosy one. No. And yet, you know, you didn't come to America and, and change your name to um, Ken and... Uh, and Even though and, they call uh, me Cam here. Cam. Okay, Cam. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, you you have made your life. I mean, within years, you start Parazit, which, of course, becomes this unqualified hit. But um, you're making this for the Iranian community, especially young Iranians, both in Iran and around the world. Yeah, like uh, I told so you, you it couldn't was you couldn't quit Iran, even even when, though you left. You it was you were determined to still play ball. 
Yeah, because uh, sometimes in your life you feel like, oh, you're doing something, you're creative, uh, you're putting this creative product out. How many people you want to reach, and who do you want to, who you want you be to be your audience? You know, uh, now you have, uh, like you, I mean, you're you're a good example. Now you're you're having this um, podcast that's reaching out to the Iranian diaspora and everything. You you made that choice, you know, that hey, this is this right now. This could be my audience. I want I want to educate them. I want to. Uh, inform them yep. and there's yep. a reason why you did that you know yep. Yep. and 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 there was a reason for me why i i just uh, left uh, the whole american theater scene or acting scene and uh and i started doing something because for iranians because i felt like um that's where i can be more helpful uh, to be honest i have a feeling that iran will change with more information you get you inform uh, iranian people more um, they will change more. You still the believe that? You still believe I that? I still believe that. I still believe that uh, if you open up the, uh, the all the block sites and everything else, Iranian people are not uh, like uh, basically they're not stupid. If, if they're not just informed because they haven't seen the information, the information wasn't available for them. Mm -hmm. So if you if you make this information available for people, I think uh, this is how Iran will change. I mean, ironically, isn't part of the information not available because of you? Because Parazi became such a hit that they closed down YouTube. No, no, I, <laughs> no, no, I tried. I you know my my job. My job is to inform people first b before comedy. Before me getting satisfaction uh, with my own creativity, uh, and before like getting um, like my other nothing up because people laughed at my joke or anything like that, what I enjoy more is when I inform people on something and I get response from people. And no, people come I, back to me and say, "Hey, we got that. We got what you wanted to say." No, what I was actually referencing was uh, I don't know if the story is true, but you know how YouTube is famously not available in Iran or very difficult to access. That Parazit was part of that. That you guys were such a success. That it, that was what forced the, the hand of the Iranian government, uh, the, the regime, to start uh, yeah. shutting down platforms. Yeah, no, I remember one. Uh, uh, I remember that the, um, this police was saying that um, uh, this, it's actually a soundbite out there that the, that he says that um, uh, this reporter was asking about the traffic situation in Iran, and it was like we got traffic under control because Friday nights we have uh, we don't have much traffic on the streets, and there was like exact hours that my show uh, or our show. Uh, was um, was uh, was broadcasting, so it was like uh, it was like mm. a huge deal at the time, you know. But um, uh, saying that, I have to like acknowledge something that the uh, Parasite wasn't like a one man show, even though I, I I I wrote the concept, I I I wrote the narrative, I wrote all the scripts. Um, but my partner at the same time, Saman, helped so much yes. to 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 cater this this show to people, and this collaborative work that we had together made it happen. It wasn't it wasn't a one man show. Do you have a sense, um, Combies? It's funny to watch the 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 interviews with you from that time. You know, t 10, 11 years ago uh, on CNN or on the Daily Show, and and you're kind of like a you, you know you're you're kind of like kids who've just put out their their first album and it's gone number one. I I mean, it's like sure. yeah, you, you guys are just like yeah. blindsided. What's happening? Do you do you have yeah, a sense sure. now, a sure. decade a decade removed, why this became such a sensation? I think uh, uh, first of all, I think it's because um, the the courage that we had to to fight our bosses um, and try to uh, put something new, put our word out. I mean, I would I didn't say anything on air that I didn't believe. And um, and when I wanted to go ahead and self censor myself and do something, I just hated myself, and I didn't do it. And I, I just fought for all those words that I said. And uh, when it became a success, or when people got notice, uh, I was so happy because it was my word. It was it was something I believed. It wasn't something that somebody else told me what to to say. You know what I mean? It wasn't. I wasn't forced to say those things. They were actually my beliefs. That's why uh, I was I was so happy at the time. I'm still happy today that after that show, um, so many. Um, I mean, it's uh, uh, products uh, has been created in, in Iranian media uh, that they used that experience that we did. Yes, and I'm so happy for that. Yeah. Why did it end? 
there's there's confusion about that on the internet at least what is what is the story what's the what, what happened with voa what's the why did you guys you had a hit show and it ended after three years uh i uh, the, uh, it's complicated um but i don't have like one answer for this um so i i don't really I, I, to be honest, I don't even know. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I don't even know what happened. I, I mean, I there are legal things that I can talk about that, or I don't, I can talk about. But uh, I, at the same time, I I never understood uh, why it ended. Uh, but definitely, um, I think it was more personal than professional. How do you know? The, the, I mean, you know. VOA, BBC, Iran International, like all of these networks, as I've keenly learned over the last year doing Rook and, and heard the voices of Iranians talk, talk about these networks and stuff, there everyone has a, a theory about, you know, who who's funding these networks and, you know, therefore whose interests they have in mind and therefore, you know, the, the people who are on these networks sure. are just mouthpieces. H how do you navigate, Combis, what network to be on given that there are interests involved yeah, the, I always, the, uh, yeah, I always say, I always say, uh, look at my content, not where I get the money from. So it doesn't matter where you get the money from. It matters what you say, you know. If you, if, 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 uh, yeah, maybe I have a mutual interest with the American government at some point, which I do. I definitely do. I work for Radio Free Europe now. It's an American-funded entity. It's an NGO. But I do have a common interest with American values. That's that's why. The, I mean, I went to them. It's not like they're like they're telling me what to say. But hey, freedom, democracy, freedom of speech, and all the shit that you see in America, most of it, I want for for uh, uh, for Iranian people too. Uh, so we have a, a me as a like a character, as a as a guy, as a I don't know media personality. I have something in common with that mission so that's how i survive and at the same time i always tell people listen to what i say not where i get the money from oh so so assuming that uh, any network that we're talking about would give you that creative and um editorial, not any network. editorial no, 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 no 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 i'm asking the question if yeah. i'm asking about any network if you had the editorial autonomy if they said you know do whatever you want would you go to any network yeah i would do the same you if, would if, if there's no yeah, you, you go you go yeah. on Iran International or BBC no, no, Persian no. or I mean I mean the show that I broadcast last uh, last week is what I wanted to do. It doesn't matter what network I'm on. That's my show, man. Okay. You know that's it. I mean I'm I'm happy that I'm in a network that they're broadcasting my stuff. I love but it. I, if, I, if I go that. Uh, if I go everywhere else, this is my I would uh, this is my show. I don't I don't change, you know. You do have this I want to come back to what we talked about earlier in terms of the detractors because you have this massive fan base. It's funny that you started the interview going uh no matter what they say about you. <laughs> you know, there are <laughs> there are folks that are not fans of yours. This that's not going to come as a surprise to you. It's it, it comes with the territory. I mean and and even a decade ago, you were telling John Stewart, I remember when he interviewed you, you know, whatever you do, they have a problem with you. They say, do something else. Yeah. Um, that's That was 10 years ago. That can only have amplified. How do you deal with what I have learned around the, not that it's limited to Iranians. I mean, this is the nature of social media and society these days yeah. in general. But how do you deal with the Iranian community pushback of expecting you or wanting to do, you to be one thing or another? I don't. I don't deal with it anymore. I'm I'm just uh, in in the beginning. I was reading comments and it was affecting me so much. I don't do that anymore, man. I'm I'm just trying to do whatever I think it's best and whatever I think is the best of me. You know, I bring that best of. I try every week to bring the best of the best of the best of me out. And uh, the problem with that is that when you do that then you give everything out and then there is like you have to understand there's next week and next show so and then you start like with a blank page again and you think like oh my god you gave your best last week what is how can you top that hmm. you know so it's i have to top myself all the time i remember when i was having that show in in in, in boa uh, my boss was telling me you're as good as your last show 
Yeah. And I'm not going to give you a lot of editorial uh, limitation. Do whatever the fuck you want to do, but uh, you, you may be fired after the show airs. So the, that is stress, the being on the edge all the time. Wait a minute. Uh, they would actually uh, say that? You may yeah, be fired yeah. after... What, sure. What I mean, the- it was it was like partly joking. Okay. But uh, but it was uh, but he was um, he was like I'm giving you uh, more editorial freedom, uh, so you might be uh, as well behaving. You know? But you know, I do feel like not to take the side of your boss, but I do feel like this this business, what we do, it is kind of day trading. Like it's like sure. you're, you're only as good as your last game is actually kind of true. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, you do it. You have a really bad show and you, you got to get back on the horse to have a good show. Otherwise, yeah. it's the last show that what people remember, you know, <laughs> like it's. Yeah, but, 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 but to be honest, I'm, I'm like a very self-critical kind of person. And I uh, and I feel like I had a lot of bad shows that I'm not satisfied with them. But people people, you know, people, you, whatever you put out, some people like and some people don't. So how I do learned, you how do you shut it out? You just literally, I, you don't look at comments anymore at all. I, I, I do once a while if, the, like I told you, I need approval from friends. Uh-huh. I, need, I need approval. I don't need approval from mass audience because I know that part of it, part of the mass audience will say, hey, you're great. You're the genius or whatever. And, and then half of it, they're going to say, you suck. You know, so I, I, to me, uh, uh, people who I believe, people who I, they know what I'm doing in terms of uh, my writings, because I write all my shows. You know, I had, I had, I had uh, writers throughout my shows, but they're always like edited, and I made it my own. So my, I'm not uh, only um, a host. You know, mm-hmm. I write my shit. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one of, one of the things I liked about you was like your opening essays in Q. Yes, I don't know who I don't know who wrote those. Me, but <laughs> the, 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 dude, the writing and the delivery and the stress you're giving me that I always wanted to know what your next sentence is. Mm. You know. So it's like you, 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 you deliver a sentence and I'm like, what's the next one? What's the next one? What's the next one? You know, so that that thing is just I try to apply that in my work that I, I need to make people thirsty for next sentence all the time. But speaking of like some people like it and some people not, can you explain to me because you're you you would have a, a really interesting insight into this, given what you've done for the last two decades. Can you explain from your perspective, why the Iranian diaspora is so factionalized? It's 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 a very complicated co- uh, question you're asking right now because uh, the thing about uh, Iranians are is that they're they're passing the red lights in Iran and then they don't give a shit about it and they come to Sweden and they stand behind red line at 3 a.m. for 15 minutes. And uh, and then when you talk about diaspora, you're talking about people. When people like uh, immigrate to a certain part of this uh, on Earth, yes. they they adopt that um, uh, that culture. Like Iranians in LA are different than Iranian, Iranians in Toronto. Like I always say, uh, Iranians in Toronto, they haven't. Uh, they still wear the clothing that they brought from Iran. <laughs> You know, <laughs> right. but but right. Iranian is, Iranians in LA, they 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 actually those clothes uh, were like uh, they throw it out and they went to H and M and and they bought new ones. You know what I mean? So you can you can always see the difference. Wherever you, you see Iranians in Stockholm are different than Iranians in Berlin. And the but it, but are, it, but there is Iranians within LA who are in separate factions that are like mirror images of the factions that they imported from Iran or sure. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just, it's just because hey, I always um, in in my in my shows uh, because it's based on uh, what John Stewart did. I mean, John Stewart has a big impact in my life, and uh, and and then he created this uh, this form of of a TV uh, shows that uh, I became a, a fond of, and I and I and I basically tried to be get inspired by. Uh, but he always like in order to make fun of people, you got to take side. But he had this constitution, this American constitution, these values that he could like stand behind and say and make fun of the opposite side. But in Iran, we, we, we believe we don't believe in our constitution. We don't have anything to stand behind except this Iranian thing, which is uh, 
I don't know, being nice with no rules. <laughs> a little bit, little bit of tar off is a little bit of a civility. You know what I mean? Not too much would be like incivility. You know? But a little bit of it is civility. It's like we've got some un, like an unwritten book of um, culture uh, that is not being like officially presented. Ever. Do you think the notion that we as a community around the world could somehow be unified is, I mean, other than at World Cup time, uh, uh, is, do you, do you think that that is a pipe dream? Do you think that that's just a stupid, that's look, impossible? The, uh, but look, the, the thing is about Iranian, you should know, uh, if you go back to history, like we've been, uh, uh, like what kind of, we're survivors, but we're individual survivors. We're good at surviving individually, but we're not, good at in the and 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 a teamwork why is that it's because like mongolians attacked us the first thing like you're sitting at your home right and all of a sudden some savages attacking you what do you do you you just like the first thing you do you, you run for your life for your own life no matter if you have a, a wife or kids you run for your life and arabs attack us and all peoples and all different things and we we just like this culture of run for your own safety you know uh it's it's become so huge you know we're, we're still like basically uh getting that from our heritage and we're still those those kind of people that we don't like think about group mm -hmm. we think about surviving because because this is how we actually was able to survive and be who we are today in some cases we have to run from a brutal regime you you did an interview talking about how agents of the regime had been threatening you. Yeah. Uh, and you, in fact, you said they'd not been doing so for years and it started again. Yeah. Are, you, are you still getting those threats? And how do, you, how do you deal with being under constant threat from the regime? Well, the threats are always, um, I mean, they became different now. They used to be, they used to, they used to like uh, write an email to me or, or, or call me or, or text me or stuff like that. But right now, the threats is, is more like they want to do more damage. They want to um, basically hack your social media. They want to, the, the whole the, uh, uh, cancel culture is sorry from them. They want to, uh, I mean, there is, a, there is this scene in uh, the Sasha Baron Cohen movie, The Dictator, that he's started running. It's like a, it's a track and field thing. And he has a gun and he... Uh, basically kills all all competitors in order for this is how they do it they yeah. don't want you they don't want to run next yeah. to your lane and win based on their qualities and their qualifications they want to eliminate you in order to win because they don't have a right rhetoric for whatever they're trying to portray themselves with you know uh, they're trying to do that but in the beginning it was like hard but you get used to it that's the thing about human being man you get even used to threats and even though you get used to threats but at the same time you know you take like one percent of that thing serious and that fucks your life yeah because you're always i mean uh, do you ever think about not speaking out like do you ever think about being uh, about just you know i can't man i i my my I, it's one one of the things that it's important in your life is your identity you know uh, yes. i mean think about think about who you are i mean the way the why you you have this show right now is because this is your identity yes and i they can't i don't allow them to take my identity away from me you know yes and uh no never you know before I let you go, you, you said something interesting recently at a at that at that talk you did at the Oslo talk. You said mm. you you are somebody living in exile, and I thought that that was an interesting choice of word because intrinsic to using the word exile is the implication that you would return if you could. I guess to Iran, would you? Uh, I don't. I, well, I, I love the food. <laughs> Definitely. Well, 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 yeah, well, you can come to Toronto for that. You don't need to no, go no, all the I, way to Iran. I know, I know. I love, I love Banu a lot. I mean, Banu is my favorite <laughs> restaurant. Um, but um, I don't know, man. I mean, time has passed so much, and I lived more of my life in America than in Iran. I'd, I, I would love to go back. I would love to be able to do what I do in Iran. But I don't know if I go back, they, they can accept me as who I am. You know, I don't know. It's just one of those things that you have to do in order to understand. If I, yeah, if I had, right now, I, I can even go to North Korea, but I can't go to Iran 
Mm-hmm. I can go into any country that I want, except Iran that I was born at. You know what I mean? So uh, it's it's one of those things. I have to go back, and if if everything is clear for me to go back, and I can still go back, but I can't get out. You know? Yes, I understand. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I, so, I, I can relate. Yeah. But I need. But uh, if, to answer your question, yes, I would love to go back, and I would love to uh, see if I'm happy there and everything. Uh, but it, it all depends. Time has changed. Um, people has changed. The new generation, like we were talking about, we're Generation X, right? Me and you, uh, and all this. I'll, I don't know about this millennials, man. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I, don't I don't. I don't. I don't like fully trusted. Uh, I don't. I'm that is not, correct. I'm not that is correct. Sure. I'm not we, we sure shouldn't that, trust them as Gen Xers. Yeah, You're I right, mean, yeah. they're like no, exactly. They're. I mean, I don't know about like oh, I don't Uber Uber share and. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know about like fuck this guy, fuck that guy. I don't know about the cancel culture, man. I don't know about that. I'd, even though I'm like uh, in, in a moral point of view, yeah, I'm, I'm, I stand. Be, but our generation, you know what we did? We put Obama, a black guy, in office, and they were they were having a hard time to take uh, Trump out. So. Uh, and they did it with our help. Uh, they couldn't do it. They did this. This uh, millennials, man. I don't. Uh, I I don't see him as something productive. Maybe this is controversial. I'm, People I'm are not, gonna like this is attack most, me on this. Yeah, yeah. You you were doing you were doing so well using crass words through most of the yeah. interview, but now you've yeah. really done it. Uh, <laughs> hey, man. I, I I really like. I can't tell you enough about how much I enjoy talking to you and and how yeah, much i valued too, this really yeah, yeah. like Vol- yeah, what let me final question what what is the best part of what you do these days uh when i get a message from a certain audience saying i listened to your show and i decided to not commit suicide anymore uh when i hear uh, a man a, a, a woman uh, messaging me saying hey man my my husband listened to your other show and he's not violent towards me anymore uh when i see uh, when i hear when i get a message from a, a, a gay or lesbian or non binary person calling me and saying hey uh, so and so listen to your show and they're treating me better now uh the actual impact you know, the actual impact on the ground uh, makes me more alive. You know, it makes me like, even though if it's not mass of people, like I don't go for, like, I don't want like to change the, the half of the society, but one or two like individuals, you know, when they send me these messages, I live for those moments. Beautifully said. Thank you, my brother. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for the energy. Thank you so much for doing this. That you refuse to you refuse to be on camera because uh, you're too handsome. Yeah, no, no. I'm. I just came from the this like one month vacation. And I, I've, I, I look like uh, Robinson Crusoe. You know? <laughs> yeah, like, uh, many people love that look. <laughs> That's a very attractive look. Uh, oh, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you so much. I, ho- I look thank forward you, to Jean. the next time. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're so great. Thank you. Khuda. Yeah, let's Bye-bye. do it. Yeah. This is Rook, episode 277. Remember, for all things Rook-related, you can go to our website, rookmedia.com, where you can also figure out how to support us by pressing the Support Us button, if you're so inclined. This is the best of Rook, and, you know, there are various occasions on the program where stories are told and laughter ensues. Sometimes it has to do with learning and uh, utilizing Persian history in the middle of telling tales. This is one of those moments from a couple of years ago with Reza, Keon, and Shia, where the Rook team grapples with Keon's history lesson about ancient Persians using cats to defeat the Egyptians. Here's the Rook funny. Look out for the Persian cat army. Here we go, Bachaha. It's all Persian to us with Keon Nademi. <laughs> Ah, yeah. Yeah. That's trauma for you right there. <laughs> All right.
high. It's the sound of one person clapping. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't even clap anymore for the uh, key on uh, poop. What do we got? I've been looking forward to this. Yeah. You teased us earlier in the show, something about cats. Yes. Uh, the This episode of It's All Persian to Us, mm -hmm. uh, where we discover what... We actually discovered yes. in terms of Persians. Yeah. We'll take it away. Well, Nadimi. Speaking of being number one, as you mentioned earlier, you know, you and Sahar yes. were discussing this. Yes, yes, I, re yes. I remember what happened. <laughs> half an hour ago. Yes. It's no secret that the Persian Empire was once the largest and most powerful empire that the world had ever seen. In fact, an estimated 44% of the world's total population was being ruled during the Achaemenid dynasty in 480 BC. Did you mm. guys know this? Yes. 44%, did you really? I well, I knew it was 44% I mean, of the percentage. world, that's, a, that's a, yeah. almost the whole world. Well, half, half. Mm. Yes, <laughs> less than half, actually. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> it's less than half, Kia. Yeah, well. <laughs> almost the whole world. Keep going, Kia. Anyway. It's okay, so yeah. The, <laughs> right, though, <laughs> so the largest world empire doesn't just happen overnight, you know. It takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It takes skills, experience, resilience, and creativity to conquer, rule, and maintain <laughs> such vast lands and peoples. Like creating one of the fiercest armies ever known to the world, for example. It's not, it's not easy being it's, conquerors. It sure is not. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, I'll tell you that much. It takes a lot of creativity. I'll have you know, <laughs> yeah. They had to come up with crafty ways to maintain that warrior edge through inventions like the high heel, for example, mm -hmm. yep. to keep soldiers secure on horseback while shooting arrows. Or the invention of polo to train soldiers to be skillful fighters on horseback. Mm -hmm. Another way was to introduce the world's first ever chart of human rights to unite people from different nations, cultures, and religions. This all helped maintain peace and order under the Persian Empire. So being crafty has always been the way Persians expanded and maintained a vast empire ranging from North Africa all the way to East, all the way east to India. Well, in 525 BC, during the reign of Cambyses II, the king was feeling quite restless. I mean, his father was Cyrus the Great, so to say that he had big shoes to fill is an understatement. Cyrus had, after all, established the Persian Empire, conquered Babylon, freed the Jews, introduced human rights, you know, small stuff like that. So how could Cambyses II, the successor and oldest son of Cyrus the Great, possibly top all of that? The answer lies in North Africa, a jewel by the name of Egypt, oh. a prosperous and powerful empire of its own right. Mm. And as the saying goes in ancient times, conquer or be conquered. So conquer it was as King Cambyses II drew up the plans to march towards the land of the pharaohs where he'd face off against Amasis II, ruler of Egypt. According to Herodotus, however, it's said that the conflict between Persia and Egypt all started when King Cambyses II asked the pharaoh of Egypt, Amasis II, for his daughter's hand in marriage. So hang on a second. Let me recap. Mm -hmm. There's a Persian Empire. Yes. Uh, things are being kept with uh, uh, peace and order, as yes. you say. I'm yeah. not sure, eh, not sure if that's universal peace during the <laughs> yes. Persian Empire, but okay. Right. There's Persian Empire. Yes. It's huge. Yes. 44%. Right. Which is, as we know, almost the whole almost world. The almost. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> and not then, enough, and, but and, sure. And then, and then there's this jewel in North Africa yes. called Egypt. Mm -hmm. And the Persians want to take Egypt as yes. well. Yes. Well, the, the reality of ancient times is, like I said, if they don't actually conquer those lands they risk being conquered, conquered right. so yes. they had to make a move before the egyptians made a move so yes. it basically came down to that okay. they had to do what they had to do Gianna, sure okay? yeah yeah <laughs> so anyway not uh back to what was i even saying yes Herodotus. this is Herodotus' take of what actually happened okay. so um who's he is, <laughs> <laughs> He's the Greek uh, historian that basically wrote all of the uh, right, ancient right. times, but not the most reliable source. Right. I'll, I'll get to that. So right. anyway, so King Cambyses II asked the pharaoh of Egypt, Amasis II, for his daughter's hand in marriage. Not willing to part with his daughter, he sent the daughter of the previous pharaoh instead. Wow. Well, Cambyses... Wait, would, what? Yeah, well... Hang on a second. <laughs> yes, go on. So who, the, 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 who offers the daughter... So the pharaoh did not want to actually send his own daughter. But the, so, per, but the, the who's our Persian? So so the ruler? story the story goes that Cambyses II right Cambyses II the second. Com, right, the second. You guys are ruining everything. <laughs> no no <laughs> sorry Cambyses <laughs> so the, asks for the pharaoh's yes. daughter. Yes he wanted to make you know unity and by uh, by and marrying the daughter. That's, that's, that's how, how they 
did it back then. Right. That's how they did it. So, so this guy, this Pharaoh, little does he know. uh, Right. Well, (laughs) Comices was no (laughs) fool. He soon discovered this trickery (laughs) and felt extremely insulted and waged a war against Egypt. Wrong. Oh, okay. What? Right. Did you say the, wrong? The wrong daughter. The wrong right. Daughter. Exactly. Yeah, okay. He figured it out. He's like, wait a minute. Something's fishy here. <laughs> yeah. So whether this narrative is true or not, we don't know. I mean, the Greeks weren't exactly the most reliable source in Persian history, but you know. Nonetheless, Comices the Second did, in fact, she, wage... She's still angry at the Greeks. I know. I know. She's still <laughs> like, you know, I don't know if we can trust those it. people. It's been 3,000 <laughs> years, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but nonetheless, this, the, they did... Comices the Second did, in fact, wage war against Egypt. This is a fact. Should we take an entire episode for this? This is very long. Well, it's yeah. it's about to get really interesting. Oh, boy. Okay. Now, right. now he good. was he was planning a battle in the middle of the harsh Egyptian desert. Who against was? Combeses. Oh, my God. Is anybody listening? Well, I'm trying to keep it straight for everybody, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right? Because yeah. there's a lot of information yeah. here. You're yeah. throwing it all out there. I mean, you want, you want people right. to tune in or not. So, so Combeses yes. now <laughs> is going after Egypt yes. because of the daughter issue. Uh, but, yeah. Well, uh, allegedly, but the oh, other but story... But we don't know because the yeah. Greeks told that story. Yeah, yeah alleg- <laughs> but uh, for all we know, he just Why are wanted... the Greeks <laughs> telling the story of the Persians and the Egyptians? I, they burned down our books, Gion, uh-huh. when Alexander the Great right. came over and just, you know, like, huh. the, you know, it's all gone. But how did the Greeks know about mm. this? How do you know about what happened yesterday in the world? News I guess travels. They had books. Their books wasn't burned. Yeah, right. exactly. Oh, I see. They made the, they wrote the books about what happened. In, but they weren't there is what I'm saying. They yeah. weren't there. Listen, yeah. with everything in history, like we, we weren't there, right? We're right. just kind of taking... But Milani tells me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I know. That's <laughs> I read his stuff. But I don't know why they... Anyway, all right. Okay. Right. So I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to figure this out. All right. right please. So, <laughs> So Comices, I'm not like these guys who pretend they <laughs> yeah. know all of this. I don't know. So, I'm asking. So Comices the Second was right. planning a battle in the middle of the harsh Egyptian desert against a mighty army on their own turf. Hmm. So he knew this wouldn't be an easy feat. Mm-hmm. So he developed a new revolutionary military tactic done by no one else in history. A psychological warfare so advanced, so genius, it would put today's technology to shame. Now that editorial, uh, that that sort of uh, editorializing about how great the Persian the genius was, that's not from the Greeks, right? No, uh, this this is Gian Nadeni. Right, this is <laughs> Apparently, this is where we get our history from. <laughs> that's all reliable. Everyone's shit. We're great. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you all in timeout so I can finish this goddamn yeah. story. Please. All right. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So he marched his army into the Battle of Pelusium and made sure each of his soldiers had with them a special protective shield, a cat. Oh. Yes, you heard me, a cat. That's- Cat Cats are good in the desert? No, that slick (laughs) Comices was well informed on the customs and beliefs of the Egyptians. Rule number one of war, know thy enemy. The Egyptians had many I gods. I conquer before you get <laughs> conquered. <laughs> 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 That's it's a lot of rules. Rule number two. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you read The, Sorry, the Art yeah. of War? There is a whole yeah. list right, of right, right, yeah. right. I have not so, read that, actually. It's a good book, yeah. book actually. Um, the Egyptians had many gods and goddesses, one of which was the goddess Bastet. She had the head of a cat and the body of a woman, and killing a cat was the biggest insult to the goddess, which was punishable by death in Egypt. In fact, cats were so sacred that they were held above humans. If a building was on fire, for example, the cats would be saved before the humans <laughs> would. Another fun fact, if a cat died of natural death, the whole Egyptian household would mourn the loss by shaving their eyebrows. Oh I have no God. idea why. These are just things that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Little Ugi's not going to be happy with it. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. all that to say, cats were pretty sacred in Egypt, to say the least and Comices knew this of course so he used their own religion against them wow. hit them where it hurts right yeah. so the Persian army plowed through the streets of Egypt swinging cats and taking <laughs> names meow PETA didn't exist in ancient times by the way even in case you're wondering right, right. yeah <laughs> so they were swinging the cats yes it was a <laughs> cata- <laughs> catastrophe <laughs> okay, <all right. laughs> I came with that one <laughs> on my own. Yes. That one's clearly you. But uh, so, okay, so, so, uh, right, we don't care. 
we, right. you know, we're, so, there's, there's no animal rights here. We, right. So, we're using the cats to, right. to distract the Egyptians because they're like, stop swinging so that. Like, then we hit the Egyptians. Well, they, that, they basically <laughs> like let the cats go ahead of them and they like, you know, pick them up and use them as a shield. And the Egyptian soldiers. This is weird. I don't know about this story. I swear to God. Uh, I who swear. Who told you this story? Where swear, did you get this story? I swear to God on my mother's life. The Persian starts swinging story. cats. And I'm then, serious. Then, wait, wait a minute. Is that, is that where the term came I'm from swinging a cat? What? Is that where the uh, term not swinging enough a cat? Room to swing I don't know about that. But and the know. point is they use What the, is the point? They use the cats. Did we win the war because of the cats? <laughs> can I just get to yeah, all right. yeah. So as you can probably already guess, as yeah, you have, right. the Egyptian army didn't fight back. They were too scared of killing a sacred kitty cat mm. and angering the feared goddess Bastet, who would punish them ruthlessly in the afterlife. And soon enough, Egypt fell into the hands of Cambyses II, making Persia the largest empire in the world. So it's at that point when I they see. took over right, Egypt that they right, became right. yeah. Because of the cats that we were swinging. <laughs> exactly. Can't wait for somebody to write in. <laughs> you know there's going to be it's like, true. I'm a professor of history <laughs> at the University of Florida. I swear to Please God. Please detain the person who was <laughs> telling no, this I'm story. I'm serious. I, yeah. I will like, I you're reference serious. the no, hell you're, out of You're very it. serious. Yeah, yeah, so, okay, all right. yeah, so uh, let me go on. <laughs> And rule they did, that is, of course, until some brat named Alexander disrupted things a bit and ruined everything, pretty much. Rude. But I digress. So the Persian Empire had to constantly be innovative and crafty with the way they ruled. That's the only way they were able to rule such a vast empire spanning three continents for hundreds of years. And according to Sun Tzu's famous book, The Art of War, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. Well... Know their enemy they did. And in the end, it's all Persian to us. <laughs> <laughs> Meow. <laughs> so, well, that's great. So what is the, what is the we discovered? The, so I, like the I, use of cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a war, as a war, as a war. I'm waiting for what? No, what the, is the? It's all the, version the, to us. The war strategy ah, of using cats against them. I mean, as horrible as it is, right. it's kind of genius in a way. Mm, it's, it's like, hmm, how yeah. could we defeat the mighty Egyptians? So they I've rounded up <laughs> thousands cats. of cats. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, you know, entered. <laughs> The Egyptian desert <laughs> swinging the cats. Dude, I don't know. Pretty how much. You, I'm, it's like that's this. how U.S. won the Iraq War, dude. I'm <laughs> yeah. telling you. <laughs> but if it's true, they got screwed. No, I mean, it, it is. is why, it's definitely, why are you guys questioning this? No. Well, I'm, I'm because offended. I think it's... Uh, I'm, I, I, first of all, I don't question that something happened to do with a cat. And, <laughs> you know... Uh, but I, it just seems extraordinary. The it army is. rounded up cats mm -hmm. and took them... Right. And then swung them. Right. So, so I mean, Here's listen, cats. Cats question. were Where sacred. Where did they get the cats from? Did they bring them from Iran? Because it would take like years You're to travel very from. Listen, and how, man, what did they feed the cats? You know, to when keep I them when I healthy for the Egyptians to be scared of them. And cats only live like fifteen years. It would take probably ten years to get to Egypt. So no. you got to bring. No. What are you? What are you? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Flew to Egypt like they they horses and It takes months. It takes months to. And they also use ships. They're in high heels, so they can run. <laughs> the Persians are, <laughs> are running in their heels. Oh man! <laughs> All the way to screwed. Egypt with the cats. Now listen, don't we know how did they, she's right? Yeah. There was a Persian Empire. Someone had to. I mean, we had to. How do you do a Persian Empire? You know, you yeah. have to rule the thing with uh, what cats. did you say? Ingenuity <laughs> and creativity <laughs> and uh, yeah. craftiness. Uh, yeah. Craftiness. And, uh, <laughs> There you go. What is it with Persians and cats? That is from uh, the best of Rook, one of our Rook funnies from a couple of years ago. Look out for the Persian cat army. Um, yeah. This is full time for the best of Rook for today. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned for our next episode of the best of Rook running all through August. We'll give it to you in about three days from now. Remember our website for all things Rook related, Rook Media. Dot com is the place to go. And thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each and every week. Smart Pega, Savvy Roham, Bearded Omid, Super P, Patty Saw, Talented Anahita, Sound Person Louise. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already on any or all of our platforms. Find us on social media. Find me on Instagram and threads 
at Gian Gomeshi. In the meantime, Mizubashi. Mizubashi.